Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another interesting session. Today, we are going to be unpacking slavery, slave trade, colonization, the African story. When you hear about slavery and slave trade, what you mostly hear about is whites came in, took our people, went and enslaved them, and we never saw them again. But that story is not entirely true. And today we are going to be listening to some of the key leaders in Africa that represent us at the global stage. There are many areas of this topic that we are going to be unpacking today. And it will help you as an African to give you clarity because we believe when you do know the truth, it will help you to shape the future better. It will help you to have perspective of the world as we see it. So with that being said, Let's dive right straight into the video. A population of people from Africa, from different nations, who are de-ethnicized, their language is taken away, their culture is taken away, their spirituality is decimated, their names are taken away, Families are destroyed. They become breeders of even more labor. You have children, and then those children are torn away from you, and you never know where they go, and they become labor in some part of the world. I mean, there is, if you talk about man's inhumanity to man, you see the way we breed chicken now, the way we breed cows now, the way we breed horses now, that is the way Africans were dealt with by the enslavers in the United States and in Europe and in the Caribbean. That's how they were dealt with. And when you are dealt with like that over a period of no less than 400 years, the impact is devastating. And that impact is alive and well. Can't this cease? Okay, so guys, you've heard that. Slavery and slave trade did happen. Uh, and some of the effects can be seen in the continent today. Uh, there is an African proverb that says, if there is no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. When you hear about slavery and slave trade, and today you hear most African leaders that are rising up and talking about slavery and slave trade. Uh, what is really missing in this story is Africans, right? We hear about the whites, they came and they took our people and we never saw them again. But what our professor outlines is the inhumanity, the inhumanity in the entire concept of slavery and slave trade. I want us to highlight the very fact that Africans participated in this trade it was not a one-sided thing the, the reason why i'm saying this is because i want to also help empower black people empower african people because we the youths today we are rising up to realize the truths behind the stories so that we can be able to embrace our history the totality of our history so that we can be strong and face the world for what it is for example, imagine that we think that we were that vulnerable, weak, and didn't have power, didn't have strength, nothing. And the whites came, penetrated our land, took our people. How does that make you feel as an African who is even thinking of rising up today and becoming somebody in the world? You feel crippled mentally, but that story is wrong. And some of these leaders with ideology Professor Limumba, with all due respect, but I, I disagree with his version of history. I, I disagree with his conclusion and application of history. Because what is happening today is like this kind of rhetoric, anti-Western rhetoric, pan-Africanism. All these concepts are very dangerous for the future of young Africans. And let me break it down. Back in the days, we had the Songhai Empire. We had the Mali Empire, we had the Ghana Empire. These are huge empires within Africa that do, did exist. 
We've heard about Mansa Musa, all those great leaders that emerged within Africa. If we think Africa was that vulnerable and the whites penetrated and captured us just like that, is that story even empowering? No, of course it's not. The reality of what actually happened is Africans used to go to war. They would go to war with neighboring tribes. And when you're captured in war, or maybe you fight and this tribe wins in battle, they capture your people. Those are the people they sold as slaves. And some of the people they sold as slaves were enemies. Okay, people that they didn't go along with. This is the truth about the history of Africa. Africa was a powerful continent with giant empires, strong kings, powerful leaders, both male and female. You could not just penetrate Africa like that. The way the story has been presented, because the reality is, I'm not saying today, Africans, you need to take responsibility for everything. Your great, great grandparents did that. And this goes to for the blacks in America and across the world. Our great, great grandparents sold your great, great grandparents as slaves. That is the real story of Africa. Now, we could blame the whites for all we care, and of which I think it's unnecessary that if we want to foster and build a better war, we are pointing figures at each other. We keep blaming people uh, left and right, and we don't take any responsibility for what actually did happen. So, so Prof said, this is the inhumane practice that was done to the blacks. They were stripped of their culture, stripped of their language, stripped of their names. No one is completely clean in this business, except the slaves that were captured. And if you go back to look at some of the conducts of the slaves and other things that happened, we don't know because people were fighting, right? They would fight among each other. And so it was the culture of that time. And my objective of this history is not to incite pain or make Africans look a certain way or make blacks look a certain way or make the white people look a certain way. It's to help us have perspective, but most importantly, so we can reconcile each other. We can reconcile with our differences and be able to move forward as a people. Slavery and slave trade is something that has happened in history. We are not the best. If you go back to the Roman Empire, go back to, to Greece, and there was always a moment where people captured each other as slaves. Is that making sense? But to twist history today and present a perspective of history, just because you want to paint a narrative that suits your agenda, is not good for the average African. We need to know our story. We need to know our history. And we started this in school. Some people were sold for a mirror. That is someone gave a mirror and took a human being. But, but if you look at this story, you might say, uh, come on a mirror. But if you look at a mirror back then, it was pretty expensive to make a mirror. So exchanging a mirror for a human being uh, was a, a, a trade. It was a deal that they thought was beneficial for both parties. So we shouldn't ignore the role that Africans played in slavery and the slave trade. And again, I want to tell this story and also it is the truth, but most importantly to empower Africans, to let you know you had powerful ancestors. And so with that, you can rise again. The reason I share this story the way I do is because I want to be real with it. Because once we are real with it, you as a black man or as an African won't be walking around with your head down. You won't be looking at a white man as somebody who's trying to kill you or trying to hit on the white man or look at the white man as somebody that will keep infiltrating your land to inflict pain on you. Does that make sense? I want us to analyze this video together and see where Africa is going so that together we can move this continent to the right direction. And so our people will not perish or will not go around with the wrong information in their head and so act terribly because they are misinformed. So let's keep listening. Slave, they came with guns. We didn't have guns. We couldn't fight. Yeah. You know, they, they overpowered us with guns. Right. 
you know? And they also bribe some of the, the, the leaders the to, chiefs, to sell off their everything. enemies and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, so it was Every, Everyone had their hands in this dirty business, honestly. You know what I'm saying? No one, no one was really clean when it came to the slave trade, unfortunately. Well, I mean, I mean. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So this is Michael Blackson, a popular comedian from Africa. He was born in Africa, raised in the United States. So he's talking about slavery and slave trade, right? He's explaining the story to someone who probably lived most of his life in the West or in America as well. But it's rather unfortunate that this guy knows the history. And what just happened right now, the guy's like, nobody was clean in this deal. They know it. Because somebody would look at it, like, what are you doing? You're talking about Africa like that? C come on now. So, so this guy knows the story. And, and he's saying, come on, Michael Blackson. Everybody's not clean in this deal. You guys were part of it. They bribed your chiefs. They did participate in this trade. And that is facts. Let's keep listening. Just, just look at his face and see how everything changes right now. Man, I'm not gonna blame too much on my on it. Poor people that trying to make a living, whatever, which was completely wrong. Right, but I'm you saying know. when you when, when you're selling off your enemies to the colonizers to be shipped around the world, you got to take a little bit. of Yeah, credit. but I mean, you got to take a little bit yeah, of blame I mean, for that as well. Yes, but the, the way the slaves were treated even before they left. I mean, if you get a chance, go to the slave castle, do the tour. Well, I, I went in, in Senegal. I went to the place where it was like the slave distribution right. center. You okay. know, the, you know what I'm talking about? The, the cannons. Yeah. Is it right by the water? Right by the water. Yeah. There's that huge, like, kind of like a like a shark tooth kind of Yeah, I, I haven't met the one in Senegal, but I've yeah. been to the both No, it was done. sad, man. I started to cry there. It was it was sad. It was a sad place to, to think yeah, that go, this go, was Go human, learn your history, you know. And, humans and, were treated like that. Yeah, it was fucked up. Yeah, but, you know. I love my black Americans. I mean, without them, I wouldn't be where I am today. Okay. Okay. That, that, that's very, very important that you notice what happened. You see, uh, I don't blame him. Uh, some of the stories have been twisted in some nations, uh, which is why I don't like the idea when people group Africa in the box, right? Because Africa is made up of different countries having different challenges. What most African countries have in common is slavery, slave trade, colonialism. That is it. But there are many challenges that many African countries face that is unique. For example, I come from Cameroon. We have, we speak English and French. We have our own internal challenges, right? And we have all of these differences. Uh, the reality is that one size doesn't fit all in Africa. And, and which is what I think everyone should know. But most importantly, know your history. And, and he said, it was a terrible thing to sell off your enemy. And what we face today, which is unique in Africa, to a certain degree, is the hatred that some of us have towards each other that we have to outline and understand that if we don't really learn how to love each other, there might be another trade in a different way and you sell your brother because it all starts from hatred, right? When you don't love yourself, because let me tell you guys, I started by saying, if there is no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. It is an African proverb, right? We know that there is no way someone will come in, infiltrate your land and take your people if you didn't participate or aid. How did these people even know how to penetrate the hinterlands, to penetrate the interiors? They use someone from Africa to do that job. And today, we could blame the white people for taking our people. But th that is a story. You already know that one. You see it everywhere. You don't even need to watch this channel if you want to hear about white people collecting our people. That story is everywhere. Today, I want just want us to have perspective, right? Look at the side of what we did and are we doing that today? Are, are we still doing that in some form today? When we don't love each other, when we hate each other, or when we talk bad about each other when we don't want someone to succeed. You see what I'm saying? Are we still projecting the same habits that led to us selling our brothers? Because the white man coming to buy your brother or buy your sister, the very mere fact that you thought of selling your brother or your sister to someone that you don't know shows that you don't really care about that person. How do you want this foreigner to 
care about your people and not treat them the way they did if you could sell them? Are we following? Because what we need in our continent today is to be able to cleanse ourselves from all of the stories that we are telling ourselves that is not true, creating some false sense of security and love that is not real. We got to face the fact and change our ways. I, I remember a friend of mine sharing a story. He was like, when I got my visa, I could not share it with my siblings. I could not share it with my cousins. I could not share it with my friends that I got a visa. I'm like, but why? You couldn't share good news? And it's like, I, I'll be poisoned. If I said I got a visa to go to Europe, they will kill me. I'm like, what? If you're from Africa, does this happen in your country? Please share with us because this is time for us young people to, to rise up, have the right perspective of the world, tell our truth, the real truth, not some version of the truth, and be able to challenge this mindset and most importantly, enhance love among ourselves. So, so let's keep watching. And one of the things that he said that got people a little bit riled up was that he said in Africa, people don't really think about slavery, whereas in America, they do. How, how was slavery really looked at out there? Um, well, in Senegal, we've kind of overcome the thought of slavery. We don't even think about it. The only time we think about it, honestly, is when we're doing tours that go to island. <laughs> you know, outside of that, people have lived and moved and way beyond the slavery concept and idea and mind state. Wow, that, that, that's interesting that Akon said that, uh, uh, that they have grown past the thought of slavery and slave trade. And I really think, I do really think that we should grow past this knowledge, this idea of slavery and slave trade. This is a historical event that happened hundreds of years ago. It has always been that way. Human beings have always enslaved one another. Ours just happened to be the most recent one. But the reality is, this is, be is becoming a business. People are using the stories of slavery and slave trade to stigmatize, to invoke pain in people of color, black people, both African-Americans and Africans so that they can be angry towards the white people. And with that, they cannot properly integrate in society and feel like they are loved and, and, and they mean something and they have a future, they have a voice and they have a role to play in the development of the world and moving forward as the human race. That notion or ideology of slavery and slave trade is a business. Because let me tell you something, guys. When you are bitter over the past, no matter how that story looks like, and it makes you look at somebody today that did not even participate in slavery and slave trade. I'm talking especially the hate on whites because I'm seeing this rising in Africa and this is not called for. We should learn how to take responsibility for our own actions and build our continent and build our lives. This anti-white sentiment is emerging in Africa. And I'm looking at it right now. I'm predicting, looking at what is going on. Some of these people who go around talking about slavery and slave trade, they're trying to twist the history to suit a narrative just to make us be angry so that we can go to war or be angry and take sides that can end up putting us in difficult situations that might hinder our own development, that might take our continent backwards instead of going forward. And, and I just thought I highlight this and just to caution Africans, because right now it's like the West is so bad. They, 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 were, they came, captured us as slaves. They came, colonized us. I'm going to get to the topic of colonization, but right now let's just address this issue of slavery and slave trade. Africans participated in this trade. Africans participated in this trade. It is empowering for a black person to understand that it was a trade and Africans did participate in the trade. 
Let's keep watching. You know there are some South Africans, and let us be blunt, many white South Africans yes. who fear Julius Malema. They, some of them have said to me, if Malema gets to power or close to power, I will leave this country. Do you welcome their fear or do you want to find ways to overcome their fear? I don't welcome their fear. Uh, Stephen, they said that about Mandela, the most celebrated Mandela. You're talking about me. They said if Mandela, a prisoner, becomes the president who are living in this country, and they left. I was in a, the Val River the other day yeah. looking at some of the houses that whites abandoned in 1994 when Mandela became a president. They are not scared of Julius Malema. They are scared of an independent black man who is not controlled by any white person, who is not controlled by London. Okay, th that's something for us to address. You, you see, Julius is a political activist. Uh, he operates a political party in South Africa. Quite interesting character. One thing I want to highlight is whites are not afraid of black people. That is a fact. They are not afraid of black people. I have lived in America for some time now, lived among white people to understand their mindset, to understand how they live, how they perceive the war. It's quite fascinating how they are optimistic and thinking of making the world a better place. No race on earth is perfect. None, no, no race. But today, if you look at the development and the inclusion of their creativity, it will tell you that they want to make the world a better place. You, you have Facebook, right? You have YouTube, you're watching this. Who created that? The West. The West created the Facebook and the YouTube through which you are watching me. And isn't this amazing? Doesn't this connect us together? Isn't this a blessing for everyone? How can you look at this and all you think about is the past and you use that as a medium to stir up grievances in people today, make people feel angry and bitter towards each other. Th there's a lot of pain in the world right now. We don't need any more pain. And so I just want to say, white people are not afraid of black people. So it, but when you are rising to power and you have the idea that whites are afraid of you, or you feel like they don't want you to succeed, you have that thinking because of how you feel inside. You are saying what you're saying because of your own internal fears. It has nothing to do with the white. Again, and if you're rising to power and your entire mindset is about proving a point to the white person, no, rise to power to help your people better their conditions, not to prove a point to a white man. That is a wrong motivation. You see what I'm saying? At the end of the day, the, the, the white folks, they are human beings like you. And if you're rising and you're trying to pose threats to them, they are going to look out for you. If someone is threatening me, I'm going to look out for what they're up to. And that's it. And those are the rhetorics that are coming out of your mouth that is putting you in that position to be questioned and your motives are being observed carefully because of what you think about the white people. Anyone on earth, if you think a certain way about me, I'm going to check you out. I'm going to be observing you to see what you're up to. That is the reality. It doesn't mean they're scared. So guys, let's keep watching. Whether a particular white person, why they hadn't been located and quote, taken to an isolated space where our supporters could attend to the guy properly. And you went on to say, you must never be scared to kill. A revolution demands that at some point there must be killing because killing is part of the revolutionary uh, uh, act. Absolutely. This was last year. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't say you're a revolutionary and then be scared to kill. But once you, you go killing a, a people around, you're a terrorist. When you've got the support of the majority of your people to engage in war, and the majority of the people are with you, that is the revolution. It's not terrorism. And therefore, I'm not a terrorist. I'm, that's why I'm saying, at least for now, the conditions have not dictated that there should be anyone who should go to the bush and engage in war to kill. But if those conditions necessitate, will will without hesitation do that. Particular aspect of your policy positions. Yes. Do you think aligning yourself with Vladimir Putin is going to be good for South Africa? But that's what it is now. 
South Africa is in... Yeah, so, so, yeah, there, there's a lot there. I, I just thought I'd pause that video so we can unpack that. Listen, guys. Okay, so so th this is the reality about the, the world that we find ourselves in. You, you've probably heard the story of Nelson Mandela. He, he was a great hero, someone that we all admire. Uh, this is somebody that went to prison for more than 27 years. He had every reason on earth to be bitter, angry, and vengeful. In South Africa, he, he came out of jail and yet reconciled the entire nation. Who some white people to be part of his cabinet. That is an amazing example for us to all follow. That even if you feel like someone hurt you, you are able to make peace and move on and prove, I believe that the greatest revenge in life is success. Be extremely successful. That is how you revenge. And I just want to say, when you hear the rhetorics of somebody like Julius, I mean, the majority of the people in South Africa are normally blacks, right? So if he's talking about the majority, he's talking about blacks. And so if you can persuade the blacks in South Africa to think that uh, the white people are their enemies, then it's easy to have the majority on your side and then you go to war, right? So, so it's easy to do that. So, so why am I saying this? Because the reason why I don't have no business into South African politics, I, I think I should be talking for my nation. The reason why I address leaders like this is because they are also championing or advocating for Pan-Africanism. That is all inclusive Africa protecting themselves against the white. So that is the whole notion. And that is why I'm concerned. And that is why I'm engaged in this conversation to also bring clarity, help my people understand and the rest of Africans to understand the whole ideology behind Pan-Africanism is coming together so that you guys can amass nuclear weapons or weapons and protect yourself against the West. That is the premise of Pan-Africanism. And I think that is not a smart idea as to why Africans should come together. We should be coming together because we want the, a common good, something that we want to do together to build, develop ourselves, develop our economies, develop our nations, be productive citizens of society. That should be the reason why we come together as Africans. Our reason for coming together is not so we can amass nuclear weapons and protect ourselves against. You think the white wants to uh, fight you today. They'll be coming with nuclear weapons. They, they'll be coming to colonize you again. No, 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 that, 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 is, that era is long gone. How many hundred years ago? I mean, like, guys, come on. Let's be realistic and look at where the world is going. Some of you live among white people and understand for yourself. I, I don't agree with apartheid. I know it was a bad regime in South Africa. But guys, let's face the fact. South Africa is one of those countries in sub-Saharan Africa where other sub-Saharan African countries can travel to and say they are abroad. And I want to say, what makes South Africa different or peculiar compared to other African countries? We will see that white people are in South Africa. We can refuse that fact. And their contribution to shaping that nation matters. I'm not saying that the blacks in South Africa are not doing, uh, doing well for themselves. They are doing amazing. I have, I have some people that I respect, like Vuzi, like Travel. I mean, like I have some great leaders from South Africa that I admire because of their bravery, because of their talent, because of their courage. Like Vuzi, I, I love his energy and business and, and consultancy and all that. And I just want to let you guys know, uh, as we move forward to building a better world, we have to grow past slavery and slave trade. We have to grow past colonization. Let's keep watching. An alliance with Russia, with India, uh, with Brazil, with China. So why are you asking me as if it's a, some policy that is going to be implemented South Africa right after now. I took over? South Africa is in alliance with Russia now. South Africa right now calls itself non-aligned. In the context of the war, but these are two different things. South Africa is an ally of Russia. Now, the second question is, where does South Africa stand on the war? It says I'm a non-aligned. 
in relation to war. But Russia remains South Africa's friend. So we cannot create confusion around there. Don't create an impression that it is Malema who's going to come and create an alliance with Russia. But there are some very specific Actually, points, I will if, go, if I may I say so. I will go beyond that. I will go beyond the, the friendship with Russia. And in the war, I will align with Russia and I will even supply the weapons to Russia. Because Russia is in a war with, un, with imperialism and any agenda that seeks to push back we are with the people of Palestine, we are with the people of Eswatini, we are with the people of Sahrawi, and we are not with Morocco, we are not with Israel, we are not with NATO, we are not with USA, because those are enemies of progress. We want to make a call in Kenya, especially to... So, uh... You see the rhetoric saying, I say this again and again, like, oh, we are not with USA, we are not with uh, all of those nations that he's mentioned, that they are not with him because they are enemies of progress. Are, are you understanding what I'm saying? Uh, the thing is, please, that is why I encourage, don't group Africans in a box. People will say, oh, Africa was one. Africa has never been one. We, we, the only thing we share in common, I repeat again, is slavery and slave trade and colonization. That is all we share in common. We have different cultures, different struggles, different experiences, and that should be taken into consideration. We'll unpack more about this as we move into this video. But, but one thing I want to say right now is, please guys, some of us want to share great relationships or want to have great relationships with America. We want to have great relationships with Canada. We want to have great relationships with Britain. All of those people that you've mentioned, some African countries have great relationships with those nations. And so if you are one of the leaders of the Pan-Africanism movement, and then you have this hatred for all these nations, and, and some of us live in these nations, and we know how we have been treated, and our lives have been improved drastically and we think that there's a lot that we can continue to partner with America and other great nations and be able to move that continent forward. In Cameroon, over 6,000 people have died because of the internal conflict that has been existing in our country for the past seven years. I've not heard a word from a leader like this that leads the Pan-Africanism movement. I've not heard a word about what is happening in Cameroon from somebody like Professor Patrice Limumba. I've not heard a word from all of these leaders from the Pan-Africanism movement. So, so with what happened between Hamas and Israel, Julius rallied his party, pulled a crowd. They were right on the street and they said, we don't stand with Israel. We condemn the actions of Israel, these leaders that are championing the Pan-Africanism movement, say 6,000 people are dying in Cameroon. What is going on? Even to propose a dialogue with our president or look at how they can solve that problem, no one has altered a word. And yet we are talking about Pan-Africanism. All of these guys have agendas. When, when you look at leaders like this, their objective is to group Africa together align us with a nation that they think is strong to incite us to go to war with a nation like America or Israel. And we know that our GDP is approximately $3.1 trillion. The GDP of the United States of America is approximately $23 trillion. The GDP of Japan is about $4.23 trillion. And I just want to Caution Africans, be careful of the nations that you align yourself with. Watch out for that. Watch out for that because you might get into a battle that will get your people killed and you'll be asking yourself the question, how did we get ourselves into this mess? Anti-Western rhetorics, anti-Western sentiments is very, very detrimental for the success of Africa. We want to progress. We want to move forward. We want to partner with any nation that means well for us so we can move forward and advance our economy. 
our sole interest at this stage of our development, at this stage of our evolution, is to make sure that we are economically viable. We don't want any colonial sentiment, uh, anti-Western sentiment, uh, slavery and slave trade sentiment. All of those messages and energy is not good for our own development. It just brings grief in us. We are sad and we feel like we have been treated bad and all of that. We don't need that. Yes, we know about slavery and slave trade. There are some historical uh, narratives or historical events that we don't want to keep hearing them. We, we know. Can you tell us something good? Share some good news with us. Share with us some strategies that can help us better our economic conditions, which is uh, something that we share in common in Africa. We want to grow. We want to go forward. Can you bring up an idea in science and technology that can advance our economy, advance our uh, healthcare system? Can you bring up a strategy which we can use to be able to advance food production? We are tired of hearing anti-Western rhetoric. We are tired of hearing hate for the white person. We're tired. We know all of that history. We don't need to keep hearing it every day. And we throw meetings and bring these leaders and they come in and remind us of how slavery and slave trade happened. We know it. Anyone that keeps telling you about the past, I've repeated this time again and again, anyone who tries to use history as something to invoke pain in you doesn't mean any good for you. Anyone that tries to use history and show you how bad the white treated you doesn't mean well for you. They want to make you become a bitter person, an angry person, and so that is going to hinder your growth. Because if you see a white person that you can even learn something productive from, you will start feeling like, oh, this person doesn't mean well for me. And that energy will not help you to learn. And so they are indirectly restricting your growth with that message, with that rhetoric, with that sentiments that they share. And some of it is coming from their own personal lives and the bitterness that they have in their hearts that they haven't taken care of it or had therapy. I really think most of these leaders would have been highlighting the events that are taking place in the DRC in Congo. There are many African countries that are facing real problems that the world should know about, that we as Africans should help these nations. Congo is a wreck. Cameroon right now is a wreck. There are many other nations around Africa that are struggling right now. They are not highlighted. The Pan-Africanism movement doesn't highlight these problems and they don't even call the attention of some of the leaders to address some of these problems within their countries. If it's USA, they will, they're going to attack it. You see them pick up microphones and light up their cameras and go on the street to talk against the United States of America. In this world, we should understand that they are big brothers. A United States is one of the big brothers, if not the biggest brothers on earth. And we got to be able to give them that respect for their accomplishments, for what they have been able to do to advance the human race. We should be able to look into that and say, we are where we are today because of your creativity, because of your contribution to the advancement of the human race. Let's, let's keep watching. The dream of a united Africa that speaks with one voice. And until we dismantle some of those borders, until we begin to wake ourselves up as a people, until we begin to realize that the, the colonizers and the rule of divide and conquer left us feeling inferior. Supremacy, white supremacy was introduced from the very onset when the colonizers came to Africa. We were taught to believe that everything African was bad, everything European was better. And we still continue to suffer from that mentality. Okay, so 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 you hear that, that, that we keep uh, continuing to suffer from that mentality. But, but one thing I want to highlight from this great woman, uh, she has uh, an amazing career and an amazing accomplishment with all respect. But I want to say the effects that we claim that slavery and slave trade left on us is subjective, right? Uh, I read these stories in school. I didn't let it define me. It was something to learn from. And every African or every son and daughter from Africa should learn from these stories and learn how to love each other to the extent that you don't get to sell one another. But most importantly, so you learn how to do trade better next time 
you can exchange resources and not people for resources, right? Or not people for stuff. And that is what every African should learn in the story of slavery and slave trade. When we come to colonialism, I'm going to address that. But when it comes to slavery and slave trade, what we Africans should learn from slavery and slave trade is that do not sell one another next time, regardless of what that trade looks like, regardless of what you need money for, do not sell your brother. Do not sell your sister. That is a lesson we should take home. You can trade resources, you can trade another good for something that you do want, but not your brother or your sister. That is the lesson every African should learn, and that is what we should take along with us. As we move in this war, do not sell one another for whatever reason. That is a message. Let's keep watching. But one thing she said is like, we've been brainwashed. Nobody brainwashed you. You choose to get your brain washed. You choose. And, and no one conditions you to think a certain way if you choose not to. I'm an African. I was born in Africa. But I choose not to think that way. No one would condition me to feel less about myself or feel like I'm an inferior human being. If you have that perspective and that is what you hold in your mind, I don't share that view. I don't carry that in my mind. I don't think that way. My children don't think that way. My wife doesn't think that way. And all my siblings and friends that we get to share and have these conversations, they don't think that way. So there are many Africans across the world that don't think that way. And that is why you see them succeeding in multiple industries because you cannot succeed at that level if you think inferior about yourself. Do you think Michael Jordan thinks he's inferior? I don't think so. Do you think uh, Muhammad Ali thought he was inferior? I don't think so. Do you think Barack Obama felt like he was inferior? I don't think so. He wouldn't be the president of the United States of America. Do you think Oprah Winfrey think she was inferior? I don't think so. So there are other great Africans, including Francis Ngano from Cameroon. Do you think he thought he was inferior? I don't think so. He wouldn't step in the ring and be able to box with some of the top boxers globally and be able to put up that show if he felt like he was inferior. And so what I'm saying is that there are many Africans around the world blazing a trail and they don't want to be reminded of these stories that help them to grieve and pain. You cannot smile sharing the stories. And if you cannot be happy just sharing the stories, why should you have them in your vocabulary? Why should you have them in your mind when they bring anything but sadness to people? Okay, let's keep watching. And, and she said, they made us to think that everything Africa was bad and everything white was good, of which I still don't think so. If you think that the whole idea of the white man was to make you look at your stuff as bad and their stuff as good, I don't think that is true. And, and there are some cultures and customs that we do share that we have to let go in order for us to develop. There are some foods that we eat even that, that will shorten our life expectancy and we have to let go if we want to live long. And there is this pastor from Nigeria. He's about 70 years old. So he's sitting in front of his congregation and they're asking him the secret of long life. And let's listen to what he says. <coughs> I, got, I got to the point where I realized that the food of Africans was designed by farmers. Mm. And those farmers, when they wake up in the morning, they can eat a cup, but maybe pounded yam. In your lunge, okalobo, a rirara lunge, can no more delay no guru. They ate pounded yam because when they went to farm, they burnt it. But here we are, we're sitting in an air conditioned church. When the service is over, I shall enter my air conditioned car. And go to an air conditioned restaurant and then go to my air conditioned home. In fact, my room in my house, they, uh, I live in a small house in Lekki, and my room has four air conditions, just my room alone. I can only put two on, even in the middle of the night, I have to put one off. So you find that our mobility is limited. So 
it became obvious that if you want to live long, you have to do some things. Can I be brutal? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Yes, sir. For all the men who are here, never forget this statement. You will never see a fat old man. So you've heard from the pastor, and what he's saying is most of the food that we Africans eat was designed by farmers. And the reason is because if they eat, like, let's say, pounded yam, and it's that heavy, and they go to the farm, they really work strenuous jobs, like maybe tilling the soil and all of that, so they can burn it out. But today, looking at the condition that we now live in and how advanced we've become, it is needless for you eating that heavy food. And what you will see is that if a white individual pointed this out and told us that this is what your food is doing to your body. Like we've seen a lot of celebrities in, in Nigeria and Africa, we've seen them go down and we realize that some of it has to do with the food that they eat. And, and you ask yourself the question, oh, if a white man looked at the food that we ate and say, hey, watch out for this. This palm oil, this is the effect that it has on your body. This starch that you're eating, this is the effect it has on your body. Oh, this white person is on our culture. They don't like our culture. They want to destroy our identity. They want to destroy what we believe. They want to destroy our tradition. And that is exactly what most Africans will say. But when we hear it from our own brother, our own father, a man that has seen the effect of the food that we eat, he said he stopped eating pounded yam 20 years ago very long time he had to quit because he realized oh this is what this food is doing to my body and he had to stop and the, the reason why i highlight this or bring this pastor's message into this conversation is to help you understand that the whole idea is for us to make the world a better place and if someone is helping you with advice to be better so you can live long you don't say they are saying it because they are white and they have ulterior motives. The question you should ask yourself is what is the life expectancy of a white man? About 78 years old, 78 years old. Or what is the life expectancy of most Africans? You say it's between 50 and 60, 65. Huge difference. This has everything to do with what you eat. Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? These are some things we have to challenge. We have to really look at the facts, look at what is really going on, be able to stand up as young people of Africa and shape that continent. Enough of us sitting back and let uh, our, our old folks decide for us, go out there and negotiate for us. We have to be able to be engaged right now, engage in these conversations, have our voices heard. You, you get what I'm saying? There are many things that I've experienced just living with the white folks and I understand how they walk. They keep to time. We don't do that. Will you say Africans keep to time? Obviously they don't, but they do keep to time. And because of that, I've learned and now I keep to time. Is that something good that I've learned from the white man? Obviously, yes. Do you think it's good? Yes, it is good. Don't waste my time. If we agree, let's mate. So what I'm trying to help us understand is let us be real. Because we can carry this tribe thinking, this group thinking, this African thinking, and it hinders us from really moving forward as a people and advance our continent and advance our various countries and be able to experience exponential success. So, so let's keep watching. Good reason whatsoever, except that we have been programmed to feel inferior. So on an individual basis, we continue to speak the gospel of truth. We continue to shed the light as to the brainwashing that is that the African has been put through, wherein lies the problem. When you look at what is being done here in Washington this world, week, and are we making a mistake? Are we? Wow, that, that that's something very hard to say. Like, I mean, I don't know how you get to that level or get to that place where you see the world the way you do. Like, we we've been brainwashed, we've been conditioned, we've been programmed. I mean, those are very hard what's to say like Africans I want to ask you a question have you been brainwashed by the white man I want you to tell me how 
maybe I'm in a war by myself and I don't understand what is going on. Can you tell me how have you been brainwashed by the white man? Guys, come on. You choose what you want to watch every day on your phone, right? You choose what you want to eat every day, right? You choose how you want to spend your time every day. How have you been brainwashed? You see this grouping of Africans and then we release a statement. It just roll across the continent like this is what they've done to Africans. Man, with all due respect, some Africans don't share that ideology. Some Africans don't align with that thinking. If I see a white man of which I've met many that mean well for me, I partner with them and we've done amazing things together and I will continue to do so. And I know many of my black friends that have been able to partner with other white folks and they have been able to do amazing stuff. We're trying to bridge this gap of racism. This gap of division, this gap of human beings hating one another because of color, because of history, because of religion, because of all of these differences that don't really matter. We have a lot in common than we have apart. As human beings, we have more in common than you can ever think. Let's try to highlight our commonalities. Let, let's try to, to highlight the things that we share in common as human beings. And with that, we'll be able to move the world forward and build amazing relationships and build a better world. That should be what we should be striving for and not raising eyebrows at each other and setting the world ablaze like we are doing right now it's not necessary. If there's anything we need in this world right now, we need more love. We need more unity. We need more forgiveness. We need cooperation. We need collaboration. Let's keep watching. Are we, is our ignorance on our side, from your impression of our ignorance, you know, amplified by us talking about Africa so much as, as opposed to talking about Rwanda, Zimbabwe, Ghana. Should we be, our, you know, is our illiteracy, is illiteracy in this level so obvious that, that it's, a, it's a real problem? And do these kinds of summits that bring everyone together do a disservice to that kind of getting to know each country more distinctly? I think for the United States, and I'll repeat it, and I used to repeat it uh, all the time during my tenure, what really is behind the failure of effective engagement with Africa is the disrespect of the Africans. Huh. That's where the problem begins. If we cannot accept, if the United States cannot accept Africans as equal partners, if the United States, for example, let's look at this particular uh, uh, meeting, this particular summit, there was no defined agenda. There has never been defined agendas whenever they meet with African countries as individual countries. It's always the United States setting the agenda, the United States setting the policies, and the United States telling the Africans about the policies. Mm. That is no way to have any meaningful engagement. If you take, for example, the fourth POCAC meeting that was held between China and the African heads of state, way in advance, the issues were clearly defined. The agenda was going to focus on trade. It was going to focus on aid. It was going to focus on, focus on investments. The African... It was going to okay, I, I just want to stop right there and highlight something before we proceed. I, I just want to say, we as Africans, she did not even answer the question. Should we address every African nation individually, or should we just group everybody together and say Africa? She did not answer that. This is what happens when you're clouded with bitterness. Uh, Mrs. Arikana, with all due respect, but I I'm talking about the spirit, the spirit of bitterness that you can't even answer a question straight, like a question they ask you, should we group you guys as Africa or should we address you as individual nations? of which I think every African nation should be addressed individually. We are in a developing stage. 
I know the idea of Africans coming together is a good idea, but this is a development and building stage of every nation in Africa. We should be prioritizing development. If we are coming together, it's to advance our economies. It's not coming together so we can group ourselves and speak rudely to the West or speak rudely to the white man or prove to the white man we are united and we can challenge you. That kind of narrative shouldn't be why Africans should come together. Is that making sense? And so she didn't really answer the question. And again, she's talking about the agenda, comparing it to China. And I want to say, as Africans, as leaders of nations within Africa, if the president of the United States summons a meeting and say, I want to meet with you, you need to come to that meeting with your agenda of what you think are some of the issues that your country is dealing with and not say, oh, they called us, there was no agenda, but China called us, they had an agenda. No, you prepare your agenda. That is why most presidents, they have spokespeople. You have all of this cabinet. You have all of these members of the parliament. What are some of the grievances that your nation is facing? What are some of the challenges your nation is facing? You put that on a piece of paper, you address a letter. When you come there, you're able to pull that up and say, Mr. President, or you call him on phone or whoever set up the meeting for you guys and let them know there are certain grievances that we would like to highlight or address during this meeting. And let the president know. You don't just go to a meeting and expect the United States to set up an agenda for you. That is you giving your power away. And then you come, you don't actually present your problem. You don't present the issues that your country is dealing with. And then you leave that meeting getting angry that, oh, they didn't set any agenda for us. Do you see what I'm saying? It is your responsibility, head of state, to do that. If not, your spokespeople should be able to have an agenda for you. Why are you going for that meeting? How can we just go have fun and nothing is talked about the nations and how we're going to do trade together uh, or the objective of the meeting? You don't even ask questions. At least if my friend calls me and say, hey, bro, I want us to meet tomorrow. Do you have time? My first response would be, w w why do you want us to meet? W what's going on? Let me know so I can prepare, right? I will ask those questions. Why do you want us to meet? And if they tell me why they want us to meet, okay, now we have an agenda. I'll be preparing based on what he said we should meet and talk about. And so when we meet, we're going to deliberate over that in the course of our meeting. So if somebody calls you for a meeting and you don't even ask questions and you arrive and you have no agenda, because normally the relationship between the United States and Africa is mostly uh, trade. There's some aspect of political interest and probably military uh, interest, but primarily it's trade. So at least there should be some questions that you should bring up regarding trade how us and your nation can trade together and be able to uh, do business together so with that ma'am i just want to say respectfully caution your leaders it is your responsibility you can't stand and say hey the united states set up an agenda for us it is the responsibility of your leaders to set up the at least have an agenda why are you going there what could be the reason why they called you did you ask and when you came did you ask and when you're leaving, did you ask? You see what I'm saying? You can't just say the United States has to take care of that. You see what I'm saying, guys? Africans, are you guys hearing me? We have to rise up and be able to be in charge. You come around a meeting, ask, why are we here? Come on. Why are we timid? We just come and we fold our arms and we just watch everything, listen to everything, and just get up and then we go back and we get mad. No, when you show up in the room, hey, I'm here. Why are we here? Or before you even show up, you ask, why are we coming? What is the agenda? What are we going to be talking about so I can prepare? African heads of states were engaged in the discussion, in the planning. The outcomes were are clearly defined with a way forward in terms of follow-up. It was a fruitful meeting that addresses the issues that needed to be addressed between not only African countries individually with China, but also Africans collectively with China. There is no published agenda. There, is, there are no issues that have been presented to the African heads of states. Africans have, been, have not been asked to, to engage in terms of creating the agenda and making sure that when the African heads of states come to Washington, 
the outcomes, the issues to be discussed are going to be meaningful uh, outcomes, outcomes with follow-up and deliverables that are going to be beneficial to both. It remains a one-sided conversation with the United States telling the Africans the agendas and the policies. The Africans are not on the table to discuss issues pertaining to us, wherein lies the problem. Hmm. And the reason that continues to be the case, what underscores that is the disrespect for Africans. I repeated it. I, I complained about it repeatedly. It is a serious problem. The United States must understand that Africans are not going to take it anymore. If you don't treat the Africans fairly, the United States is going to see itself slowly losing ground to China, to Russia, to all other nations, because without respecting the Africans, without treating the Africans as equal, without understanding that exploitation and abuse of Africa simply cannot continue. Okay. So that, that is very important. Uh, but one thing I want to lead Africans, especially African leaders uh, in this dispensation to understand about their relationship with America is uh, you can run to China, right? Because now they treat you better as she claims. But one thing I want you to understand is America made China. And all you have to do is look at where China sells most of their products. More than 50% of the products produced in China are sold in America. More than 50%. China sells their products to Japan, United States of America, Germany, and other European countries. More than 50% of their money is made from America. Look it up. I'll put that on the screen. And I just want to let Africans know, it's not just running to China that will help you solve your problems. And you've dealt with America for some time. It's like relationships, right? It's like marriage. Uh, you're with your wife. You, you don't talk with her. You don't try to solve the problems that you guys are dealing with and you've known her for a very long time and you think, oh, maybe let me divorce so I go marry another woman because I've seen her smiling and laughing and she might be a good prospect. Guys, you know that it's better that if you've had even children with this woman, you've had this amazing life with this woman, you can work out your differences. And I just want to let Africans understand that you guys are at the crossroad and there's more if you can change your strategy and learn from America than you are running to other nations. I'm not saying you should not have relationships with China. It is good. I mean, we live in a global economy. I mean, you should learn from everybody. I mean, like America is not the only country on earth that you can learn from, but I want to say there's more that America can offer to us if we will show up and not be timid. Americans are not timid people. When they show up in the room, they show up. They are just confident. You got to be that. Nobody tells you to be timid or walk into the room and not have your, your, your questions answered or have your voices heard. No one is restricting you from doing that. You got to just be confident, y'all. You got to work it out. When you're with us back home, you're confident. You will give orders, right? Like the president, you will say, yeah, this is who you are. And you call your militaries and you give orders. When you come abroad, act like that. When you come to the States, act like that. When you're in meetings with these parliamentarians or with these presidents of the United States and other European countries, be confident. And, and I know why you cannot be confident. Because we have these baggages of colonialism in our minds. We have these baggages of slavery and slave trade in our minds. We have to get over this mindset and face the situations that we are dealing with head on. When you walk into the room, be confident and address the specific problem you're dealing with. And be confident. Look at people in the eyes. Because we grew up in a continent where, oh, don't, don't look at a, a, a senior person in their eyes because it's disrespectful. No, look at people in their eyes, shake their hands, present your perspective, and that will help us engage in better trade without which we will keep coming and coming back and we'll be angry we'll come go back and be angry come go back and be angry and never have our voices heard what she's saying might be valid but we've not heard any african leader come back and and do a video and publish online to say they were not happy about that meeting you should say something 
and structure your meeting better next time. But, but why she's talking about China as maybe the better alternative? I want us to listen to Professor Limumba and his perspective on China. You know, as I talk about African unity, China refuses to get out of my mind. And I hope I'm wrong. But the Chinese know that we are disunited. And they know that in our disunited state we can be manipulated. And they are in the process of manipulating us. <laughs> you hear that? So Professor Limumba doesn't think China means well for us. I'm just bringing all of these conversations to us to understand that they are leaders within Africa with different positions on China, which is quite interesting. She just said China treated us better. Professor Limumba thinks it's all manipulation. So, so let's keep listening. So today, there is not a single African country in which the Chinese have not built a stadium. They think we love stadia. There is not a single African country in which they are not building some roads. The Chinese are capable of delivering three types of qualities of the things they do. Quality number one they take to the United States of America and Europe. Quality number two they take to their fellow Asian countries including India. Quality number three, which is at the very bottom, they dump in Africa, and the Africans consume them gleefully. Okay. Uh, th that, that is quite interesting. But uh, one thing that you notice is, yes, China has been able to come up with a business model. Like, like I said, I, I still believe that America is a preferred business partner for Africans if they would just deal with America and be straight up with what they want, right? Really be open and express themselves with what they want, their position in that relationship. It's very important that they highlight that. America will never do that for you. You got to do that for yourself. But one thing I see about China's business model, which is amazing, uh, say China produces an iPhone. If they produce the original iPhone 14, most African nations will not be able to buy it. You see what I'm saying? So they try as much as possible to produce different grades of that same phone. And so what they are selling to Africans is what Africans can afford. Look at the GDP of the continent. I don't think you can look at China to be manipulative in that context, saying that they have this malicious intent towards Africa because you think they are selling the third grade product to Africans. I don't think so. So with that, but again, I want you to understand the GDP of Africa. I want you to understand our per capita income. I want you to understand the average household income of Africans. If you do have this records, I think you're very knowledgeable and smart man, sir. So you should know all of this stuff and understand why Africans are being sold at third grade. It's not an insult. It's what their money can afford so that they can be able to enjoy maybe iPhone 15, if that makes sense. So, so but let's keep listening to Professor Limumba. He is quite an interesting figure. I love his perspective uh, and I love his rhetoric and how he articulates history. But, but what I don't like is his application of history. Uh, history should not be used to incite violence, incite war, mobilizing Africans to have nuclear weapons and prepare themselves for war. That kind of idea is wrong. Hating on the white people because of slavery and slave trade is wrong. It is wrong for every African. Please hear me. It is wrong. The white people don't hate you. The white people like you. They want you to be better. They come to Africa and they do amazing stuff to help the continent move forward. I mean, slavery and slave trade happen, colonization happen, but the world should move forward. And we should see everyone that comes to help us that way and not be suspicious of everyone and ourselves as well. So let's keep listening. And it's because of our disunity, we are incapable of speaking with one voice. You know, many times when I look at Ghana, the Ghanaian president whom I respect, 
is invited to Beijing to negotiate with Beijing, as indeed the Kenyan president would be, and the Burundi president, to negotiate with Beijing on a bilateral basis. And when they invite African leaders, they humor them, complete with guards of honor and 21 gun salutes, so that they think that they are equal. But the Ghanaian economy's GDP is possibly one-third of the GDP of the city of Beijing. The Burundian economy is only two billion United States dollars, which is the same amount that an American professional boxer earns in one year. <laughs> the economy of Benin is smaller than Coca-Cola's advertising budget for one year. In other words, African economies are Mickey Mouse economies, which cannot compete. And because we are disunited, we are incapable of moving as one unit. The European Union wants to have what they call bilateral negotiations with Benin. The European Union's combined economy, perhaps the largest market in the world today, is something in the neighborhood of 14 trillion United States dollars if you combine the European Union economy and you have bilateral negotiations with Benin. That is smaller than the turnover of Standard Chartered Bank. In other words, the president of Standard Chartered Bank could very well be the one negotiating with the president of Benin, if we were to be realistic. But that is because we are disunited. And I'm submitting to us that the only antidote to that is our unity. I know, as I said yesterday, that there are already efforts to move Africa in the direction of unity at the economic front, but the suspicions in Africa are too great. The African politician is perhaps, with due respect to them, Africa's curse. Okay. Wow. So that, that, that is a lot right there. So, but, but I just want to break that down with you. So you're watching this and you're listening to what uh, Professor Limumba is saying. Uh, there are some facts to it, right? But I, I don't completely agree that the problem that Africa is facing is entirely on the leaders. So there are other aspects of the issues that Africa is dealing with that has to do with the people. Okay. Uh, one thing that is going on in Africa is the suspicion aspect. And I agree with that 100%. Africans are suspicious of one another. Uh, the leaders are suspicious of their people. The people are suspicious of their leader. So there's that tension between Africa and their leaders, African countries or Africans and their presidents, there is that suspicion. And we have to eradicate that, right? Because this is what happens. When a people are suspicious of their president, their president feels like this people could overthrow me. They could be a coup. They could kill me. And what the president would do is, the president will invest in military instead of the economy to protect himself. In case the people think of overthrowing him tomorrow, he has a strong military that will be able to fight against every oppression. And not only that, they are going to partner with other foreign nations based on protection, right? They're going to have relationships based on protection that in case my army is not sufficient to protect me, you guys will come to my aid. So they spend most of their money in the military. They invest most of their money in the military instead of the economy. So Africans, we have to learn how to trust our leaders. African presidents, you, you got to learn how to maybe unite with your people. This union is very, very important for development in Africa. Coming together as Africans is, is a big myth at this level of our development. I think what we need is some healthy competition. When we talk about the European Union, people are like, oh, look at Europe, they're united. We know that Europe did not start by getting united. They had to work extremely hard, separately, fought against each other for a very long time. You've heard about the story of France and Britain, even America and Britain. There has been this consistent battle for a very long time before today you hear about the European Union. These nations are coming together with their GDPs in the trillion. 
there's no African country with a GDP in the trillion. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So when we compare the European Union to African Union, it, it, it doesn't make sense at this level. What we need to be doing at this level is unite within our nations. The unity should start at home, right? You can't just, there's a lot of division within African countries that professor knows about. You, you live in Kenya, you, you know about it. There's division between tribes in Kenya. When we solve these internal problems within our nation, and then we are strong, and then we come together, guess what? We will be strong. As a relationship counselor, one of the things we advise people when they uh, break up from a relationship or they divorce and they want to get into another relationship, what we encourage them is to get therapy. Be whole. Guess what? Hurt people, hurt people. You know, when you are broken and then you get into another relationship, you are going to hurt everybody else in that new relationship that you're moving into. And that is what will happen if the African Union become a reality today, uh, the Pan-Africanism concept becomes a reality. Because why? We having hurt people coming together, getting healed to a certain extent. No nation on earth is perfect. Mind you, there's no nation on earth that is perfect. But to a certain degree, get healed. Be united within your nation. Love yourselves within your nation. And when you guys are strong and then you join that union, it will be a better union full of people with optimism, not pain and sadness and filled with the past of slavery and slave trade and all of these grievances that we have in our hearts. We have to walk independently grow, develop our nations. If you partner with another nation, maybe they have a product or service you guys can exchange. Fine, you can do that at the level of your development. But coming together to unite based on the objective that you have, sir, I think is going to be very dangerous for Africa at the stage of its development. This is the time for Africans to develop themselves independently. When we have a little bit of beef sometimes with Nigeria, it is good. It stimulates the energy for us to work hard. Like, like Nigerians will come over to play soccer with us. Oh, they're leaving. Oh, it's 3-1. And we're like, oh, we beat you guys. Guess what happens? You cannot just say let Africa have one single national team. This, 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 this uh, competition, this healthy competition, it's not like we have a beef with Nigeria, but it's healthy competition. We're like, oh, we did better with movie. Or they say they did better with movie. Or they're number one in music. Or we have this artist that is doing well in music. Or we have the best boxer. Or we have the best soccer player. We have this healthy competition between Nigeria at the level of entertainment and sports and all of that. We should have that healthy competition in business as well. It helps every nation to grow. And as we do grow, and then we can partner at some stage, at some level, and be able to say this is an African union, at least be coming on the table with the GDP and the trillions. Come on the table, say, give, give a challenge to every African nation. Let's say in the next 20 years, at least your GDP, the minimum uh, nation in Africa, the, the, at least the least nation in Africa, should have a GDP of at least a trillion dollars. Right? How about that? In the next 20 years, at least the smallest nation in Africa should have a GDP of a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars, that can be a challenge. Right now, what we need is to empower our young people in Africa to get into the industries that they can be able to compete globally, generate income, learn skills, advance their economy so that we can generate income and be liberated from poverty. Right now, we are dealing with many internal problems that we cannot solve them by coming together. We got to deal with those internal problems separately, get healed so that when we come together, we will be able to be assets and not liabilities to each other. If right now we come together, we will be more of a liability to each other than an asset. So that is my proposal to this entire concept of Pan-Africanism. And uh, I think I read the constitutions or what the Pan-Africanism uh, concept is all about, and it was not really something that enticed me. And, and I wanna say, we, we should come together for a, the common good. Let's come together, let it be Africa, for the world, not Africa for Africans. The whole concept is Africa for Africans. Let us have Africa for the world. Let us build 
and move these developmental projects to the world. We've been beneficiaries of what many nations across the world have been able to produce. We have iPhones today. We drive automobiles today. Uh, we have uh, YouTube today. We have Facebook today. We have uh, everything. Most of the things that we do enjoy, modern houses included. All of these developments come from the West. I want an Africa that can compete internally and be able to produce and be able to bless the world as well. Let us be that catalyst of change. Let us be the people that produce the next iPhone 20 or whatever that means, or the new brand of phone. Maybe it would just be a phone that is in the air and all you have to do is just stretch your hand and then the phone you can call without even seeing the phone, whatever that is. Or maybe it is having a home that you just need a button and all of a sudden a home appears and then you're able to have a place to sleep. Whatever that is, that might be the next development that comes from Africa. Let's be thinking in that dimension. Let's have conversations like this on the continent. Let's have meetings to discuss these ideas. Let's also not forget the fact that we can partner with white folks, with European folks. We can partner with many other nations that have been able to advance this technology, partner with them and be able to grow and not be limited saying that we have to only stick together as Africans. Let's expand, let's stretch. Let's not let geography limit us. Let's be able to stretch into the rest of the world and have our voices heard, make a major contribution. We've had great people from Kenya make amazing contributions to the advancements of technology in America. That is amazing. We've had great people. Kenyan people are very hardworking people. I love your people, sir. And they're amazing people. And I think if we can be able to instill this energy within Africans, young Africans growing up, Learn how to love, forgive, and let go. Slavery and slave trade never happened to any of you all. It happened to your great-great-grandparents. We were not alive. And whatever business they had with the great-great-grandparents of the white people we see today is none of our business. We let it go, and then we move forward. The white man you see today is not the white man that got into slavery and slave trade. If everybody has to hold you on something that your great-great-grandparents did and because they see you, you have this color of your skin and so they should treat you that way, guys, it's going to be hard on each and every one of us. We will not be able to breathe if you can look at anyone and think about what their race did to your race some hundreds of years ago. It, it, the world will be a tough place for each and every one of us. And I think this is the greatest trap used by the enemies to hold black people down to make you try to hit the white person so you will not grow, so you will not advance. Today, young people, we are realizing and we are seeing what is going on and we are saying we will not go that way. We will not go that way. We will forgive. It, it was not us. It didn't happen to us. I don't want to feel guilty or feel shame or, or feel inferior or because of something that my great grandparents, he was a probably a bad businessman. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, I remember going to school and people would come around and they'll look at it because I didn't come from a so-called like a wealthy home. Uh, I come from humble beginnings. And people will come around and they try to look at my father's home and they'll be like, oh, uh, is this where you live? And all of that. Yeah, yeah. I said, this is my dad's house. It is not my house. It's my dad's poverty. It's not my poverty. Today, I'm making my own way in the world and carving my path. And if you see me today, you want to attribute what my father had to me. Good luck with that. I'm a different person and I had my own life. I have my own life and I'm carving my own path in the world. And so should you. Every, every young man, so should you, every young woman, everyone has their unique lives. And that is one thing I find fascinating with the West. And that is why our concepts is just funny to most of the people in the West. Because why? They believe in an individual. We believe in the community and the history and everything that constitutes that individual. But that is not the reality. If everybody had to hold you based on something that is connected to some member of your family, it is going to be a painful world for us. Please, let's, let's think about it in your own family. Just imagine that somebody had to hold you down or try to look at you, stigmatize you based on something that happened within your clan. And why? Because we think in a community setting. We think in a community kind of uh, environment. That is how we perceive the world. But I want to say we are integrating and seeing what is happening today and we understand, guys, Holding grudges in your heart will not help you. Uh, a clergyman once said, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. You drank the poison and you're waiting for that other person to die. And that poison is eating you. I've lived among white folks. 
they don't have conversations about pain and trauma and issues like this in the past and they don't transfer it to their children. And guess what? They are free and they are able to go out and explore and grow. Can we be able to let go of all of this history so that our children can be able to explore the world with, their, with a free mind? Okay? So that is the kind of world that we should leave for our children. A world where they are not grieving. There are some history that we should not even know about. A quick story and then I'll let you guys go. There was a time when the ancestral DNA thing came out and everybody was fascinated to know about their ancestor. Uh, there was a man who wanted to do his ancestral DNA and he went and did it. And he realized that somehow he's connected to Hitler. And he realized that it was a, really a terrible idea. And he said he regretted trying to go pay to know who his ancestors were. Because when he knew it, he felt sad. Like it, it was better he didn't know about it. There, there are some issues, truth be told, that if we want to keep them in our heads, they will really limit us in this life. If we want to have those stories in our minds about some historical event, which is the cause of why we are where we are today, it is going to really distract and hold you back. Let's go past these things. Initiatives. Absolutely. The brain drain that started over 400 years ago when the best and the brightest and the fittest were taken out of Africa forcibly. And that, that is when the brain drain started. I want to make sure that is very clear. Hmm. And when we talk about African diaspora, we're talking about all people of African descent living outside of Africa. Hmm. Let's be very clear. African-Americans, they are Africans who were forcibly taken out of Africa, plus the continued brain drain, those who are later immigrants, who left Africa running away from famine, from wars, in search of greener pastures. The end result is, as we speak, Africa has a serious deficit of expertise. Right. However, the, the, uh, the good news for Africa is that we have a very young, intelligent, vibrant population that need opportunities. So when we can marry the age group of young, intelligent Africans with the expertise coming from the diaspora, we can see an Africa that can propel itself to take its rightful place on the world stage like it once was. So yes, the diaspora. Okay, so when, when she's talking about the diaspora, she's talking about Africans that are living among white people and really learning from the white people. Are, are you guys following with me? Most of us in the diaspora, let us be respectful. I think the disrespect towards white people among the African community is too much. We need to learn how to show some respect. There's a lot that we can learn from the white folks uh, in terms of development, in terms of tech. And we cannot learn with this attitude. We, we cannot learn and grow with this attitude. We have to come down from our high horses. We need to know where we are at our developmental cycle and understand that we really need to be humble and learn at this stage. Even if you want to puff up your shoulders, this is not the time. Look at your GDP. Look at the productivity in your continent. Look at the, the level of poverty. We have to agree and accept these things. We have to accept these things and work hard. We need more people going out there today and working instead of staying on social media and getting entertained. We need young people going out there and developing skills instead of trying to look for a fault in a white man. I think we need to do more with our young people. Like she said, we have a young, vibrant population. We should not feed them with the stories. It will not help them. They will become like us. They will be thinking like you. Because if you keep listening to the stories of your ancestors and how they were treated and all of that, how can you learn and move forward? How can you understand a line of code? You want the line of code to be translated in a native language that you have. Instead of us understanding the big picture and what can help us move forward as a people, we will be there caught up with all of this slavery and slave trade stories that will lead us nowhere. Please, let's tune it down. It did happen. Saying it or not saying it won't change it. You can never change history except you have an agenda to make the young people today be angry people. It is not necessary. Let me ask you a question. What do you think, ma'am, sharing that story 
to a young man will do for them. I, I just want to understand. Most Africans watching, what, what, what does these stories do for you mentally? How does it help you? Does it add some money into your bank account? Does it help you to go negotiate a deal better? What, what, does, what is the significance of these stories? When you share these stories of slavery and slave trade and we keep regurgitating these stories, what is the benefit of these stories? I want to understand every African who is on this platform, what is the benefit of sharing these stories? I think if there's anything these stories do to you, it, it's help you to, to be negative inside, pain inside, traumatized inside. You will not have a good smile on your face after you listen to the stories. It's like watching the news. And when you leave, you're depressed. Right? So please, ma'am, professor, let's share good news. What is the good news? What is the good news about Africans that we should know so that we can be able to move into the world and, and have that energy, that spirit, that optimism that we too can do something with our lives? Please share those stories with us. You guys have uh, amazing rhetorics. You, you're very eloquent. You're very uh, uh, prolific. Share with us the stories that will inspire us about Africa. That will inspire us. What did our ancestors do that you think was right, that you liked? Can you share those stories with us? Who are some of the great heroes from Africa that you like? That were positive, optimistic, and did amazing exploits. Share those stories with us. We want to hear about the greatness of our leaders. We want to hear about the greatness of our heroes, the people that we should be looking up to. We don't want to hear blame or hearing the whites doing every kind of nasty thing you can explain to us about our past. Can you tell us something that is optimistic about our past? Do we have anything even good about our past? Because we don't hear that. We only leave depressed, leave depressed. We leave after we listen to you guys, we feel depressed, we feel defeated. We listen to you guys, we feel depressed, we feel defeated. We listen to you guys, we feel depressed, we feel defeated. And so we cannot move on in life. Those stories have psychological impact in our psychic and it's not healthy for our own development. So please tell us good news. Share good stories with us. We want to hear positive things about Africa, positive things about our leaders, positive, oh, I mean, I mean, even positive things about white people. What is good about the white man that you like that you can share with us? What has the white man done for you that has impacted your life that you think we can learn from them? We are in that diaspora that you're talking about. What can we learn? Share with us the good things that they are doing, that you've seen from afar, that you admire and desire, that we can learn, bring it back to the continent and advance development. What is the good thing that you see the white people doing? Is it vehicles that they produce? Can you tell us about it? Is it the computers that they've made? Can you tell us about it? Remind us about their genius and how we can learn from them. What is it that you can inspire us to learn from these white folks? Is, is it the internet? Is, is it Facebook? Is it YouTube? What is it that they have done that inspires you to be able to motivate us young people so we can be able to do well for ourselves and be able to move the continent forward. I love you guys so much and I hope this session has been inspiring. Uh, yes, I wanted to break down this video so we can understand a little bit about the African story. It's very important that we have this balanced perspective, understanding that Africans played a role, a significant role, not just a role, a significant role in slavery and slave trade. They were part of the transaction. And we take, if you have to take responsibility for your great grandparents, yes, then we take responsibility. But I don't believe I got to take responsibility for what my great grandparents did some hundreds of years ago. But we can learn a lesson from what they did. I'm not taking responsibility for what my great great grandparents did, but I can learn a lesson from what they did. Do not sell your brother. Do not sell your sister. Do not capture them as slaves or prisoners of wars and sell them. You are setting them on a bad foot to fail and be treated as slaves. That is what every African should learn from that story. Yeah, so that is the reality. If you want to take responsibility for what your great grandparents did, fine. But the most important thing is that we learn the lesson that we should never sell our brothers or sisters no matter what. Do not capture them as slaves and sell them. Do not capture them as prisoners of war and, and sell them. 
if we do not learn this lesson, we will keep selling each other. And that is why most Africans in Africa extort money from their brothers and sisters abroad and they want you to walk as a slave and feed the family back home to death and they don't care about how you feel with the living conditions that you're under in the United States or in the, the diaspora. They don't care about your living conditions. They don't care about what you're going through. They don't care about your own life. All they care about is that you send money to them. You send money to them. That is all they care about. And I just want to say that is another dimension of you selling your brother. That is another dimension of you considering your brothers and sisters as slaves. That mindset, that specific mindset prevail in the continent. We have to learn how to love and treat our brothers and sisters as human beings. Because you might think you've traveled abroad and they look at you with respect. No, you are the slave now for the family. You're the slave now in the family. And you got to walk yourself to death. There are many people that have died walking in this nation. Because why? They want to provide some money for their siblings back home. And that is the narrative. When you share the stories, you are enforcing that spirit. And it's like that spirit is still in us to sell one another. To, to betray one another. And we got to quit that. Because it will take us backwards. We will not go forward. Our brothers and sisters are in the diaspora. We don't see them as an asset. People that can come back with great ideas and help move the nation forward. We see them as tools. We see them as a money machine. We see them just as people that don't provide the money. Don't advise me. Don't tell me what to do. Just give me the money. Who are you? They will never even call you and ask you for ideas. Like, what do you even know? We know why you're there. You're a slave. Because there's a mindset that everybody that went was a slave. There is that subconscious thinking. They were slaves. So slaves have to be producing or give from where they are. It's the thinking. And when you walk around and you see African Americans, it's a result of that. Some hundreds of years ago, we, 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 our great-great-grandparents sold their great-great-grandparents as slaves. That, that is the history. Today, don't let anyone twist the history and tell you otherwise. That is the history. And so we learn from it. And then we never make that same mistake again. No matter the form that we've had the slavery and slave trade coming in today, we should be able to identify it. Because today it's, it's people who travel abroad are the modern slaves. Those who travel abroad today are the modern slaves. And we have to be able to look at each other with love, respect, understanding, believing that they are their own human beings, try to learn more from them than trying to take from them, there are great ideas and advice and wisdom that you can extract from your brothers and sisters that are in the diaspora other than money. Money is not the sole purpose of life. It's like when you travel abroad, you become enemies with your relatives. There's no friendship anymore. They see you as the bank. It, it's just painful. But there's an amazing relationship that you had. And it's like you travel abroad, that relationship will be ruined because of the expectations. So, ma'am, Let's speak well about the white people because I've seen that none of them that I've hang around meant any evil for me. We've been in tragic situations in this country. Fire burned our home. White people came to our rescue. My wife was pregnant with our first child. My car broke down on the road. It was a white man. People were driving past us. It's a white young man that just came back from the military that stopped to help me and my pregnant wife. So before you want to say bad things about white people, I've experienced much good from the white people in this nation than my own community. They've done so well for me. They've been able to help me in many areas of my life, and I'm very, very grateful. I am who I am today. It's all thanks to America. Even at the point where I felt like I lost all hope, they were the people that stood around me and made me to believe in myself and led me to understand that keep going, never give up. Starting a church in America, it was white folks that stood around me, prayed and blessed me and contributed money to help me start a church in America. I don't just want to leave this in the air because I'm a beneficiary of this system and I see how they're able to share great advice, great ideas. My pastor from my community will pray for me and tell me, go, God bless you. But a white pastor will break down things and teach me what I need to do to build a successful church. That is the experience that I've seen in America. 
We need more love among ourselves and not more hate. And all these messages will just promote more hatred among us. And if, before you notice it, you will sell another person. If we keep spreading these messages of slavery and slave trade among us, these messages are going to incite another thinking in us. Before you notice it, you, you start selling people in, in another way. Do you see China saying, oh, you guys come back home, let's build China? No, you guys develop Africa. You're there, build it. You cannot abdicate that responsibility. You can't run away from it. You don't see other nations across the world saying, oh, let our people come back. Why are we the only one trying to do that? We see other races across the world. See, look at the, the look at the, the, the Mexicans. Look at there are many other races across the world, spread around the world. We are not the only people that are around the world. There are many other races around the world, and they are not advocating for their people to come back home. Why do you want that? You want that because you know your condition is hard, and you think that if these people come in, they're going to help better your conditions. They will come with technology. They will come with ideas. No, you didn't send them there. You sold them. Your great great grandparents sold them as slaves over there, and now they are trying to make out a life and you want them to come back, please build your con continent, build your continent, build your nation. No one is coming to do it for you. We want Africa to come together before we develop Africa. No, develop your nation. Africa does not have to come together for you to develop your nation. Develop the manpower, train your people, educate your people, let them be skilled and develop your nation. It is your responsibility. It's not Africa that will develop a particular nation. You develop your nation. Those regions that you have, uh, your country, uh, it could be Cameroon, it could be Nigeria, it could be South Africa, Ghana. De Ghanaians develop Ghana. Kenyans develop Kenya. South Africans develop South Africa. Nigerians develop Nigeria. Congolese develop Congo. You have to show a certain degree of responsibility. We have to start understanding that no one is coming to save us. We've called for the white folks to come save us. Now it's not working. We want to call for the diaspora of blacks to come save us. Let us work hard and develop our continent. I love you guys so much. And until next time, stay blessed. All right. If you like this video, you're going to like this other episode. And you can watch it by clicking right here.